The bright lights of the cities of Japan are enough to dazzle even the most jaded of travelers. Home to the third largest economy in the world, and a hub of scientific and technological innovation, Japan is a powerful country, with a culture which has absorbed and internalized influences from parts of Asia, Europe, and even North America. But more than that, Japan is also the site of social change, the home of nuanced and oft overlooked histories which demonstrate an immutable truth, that queerness exists here, just as pervasively as it does in the West. As the first of several episodes looking at the LGBTQ plus communities of Japan, join me in Kyoto as I discover what queerness looks like when represented in contemporary Japanese arts and media. Welcome to episode four of Slash Queer. You're here with me, your host, Georgie Williams. During preparation for my journey to Japan, I more often than not had inquirers express their surprise at taking Slash Queer through what they considered to be a conservative country. The assumption, by and large, was that I would struggle to find a history and contemporary presence of queer culture in Japan. As we will address more specifically in episode 5 of this podcast, Japan's cultural history is not lacking in examples of what, through a Western lens, we would consider to be queer culture. Prior to the Japan leg of this trip, I discussed the matter of LGBTQ plus visibility in Japan with Marta Fanaska, a specialist in gender studies, queer theory, and pop culture, who is undertaking her PhD in Japanese studies. Marta explained to me that, instead of terms such as gay or lesbian being considered identity descriptives, as they are in most of Western culture, much of Japanese society consider these terms to denote a sexuality preference, and this preference is framed as being a deeply private, personal matter. Although these terms are in use and have been adopted into the Japanese lexicon, what they represent has evolved as it has been translated from Western culture to Japanese culture. At this point, it may be useful to step back and, for a moment, discuss the application of the term queer in the context of Japanese culture. As I have addressed in articles previously on the Slash Queer website, the word queer has powerful connotations rooted deeply in its history as an anti-LGBT slur. Not only does the use of the word queer presuppose a history of struggle, it is also a word originating from the English language. It denotes something outside of the norm, when the norm is defined through contemporary Western parameters. In other words, what is queer is outside of the bounds of what people in the UK, US, and many parts of mainland Europe would consider a normal or more common identity. In that cultural context, it denotes individuals who do not identify with their assigned gender at birth, are not exclusively attracted to a sex other than their own, or do not engage in sexual behavior whatsoever. We may have to be careful using language from one culture and community to describe another, it may be harmful to frame certain behaviours or presentations as a deviation from the norm if our frame of reference for the norm is an entirely separate society. At best, it is an insensitive oversight. At worst, it borders on being a colonial practice, imposing language and social parameters that another community does not want or need. In order to understand how queer was used or not used by Japanese communities, I decided upon my arrival in Kyoto, to consult a local expert. Professor Yuka Kano of Stanford University is a specialist in visual studies, with a focus on feminist studies. As of late, Professor Kano has been working on projects exploring queer film festivals, as well as transnational queer girls' cinema and culture. She is currently working as an associate professor at Toshisha University in Kyoto, where she is a founding member of the Feminist, Gender, and Sexuality Research Center. As addressed in episode 3 of the podcast, it is evident that the arts, particularly the visual arts, have often been utilized in matters of queer cultural awareness. Visual arts have the power to confront and challenge social norms, provide representation for marginal communities, 
and provide insight into the lives of individuals whose experiences and hardships may be alien to many of us. Overjoyed to have received Professor Kano's approval of the third episode, I was excited at the prospect of picking her brains over what queer visual arts, particularly cinema, looked like in modern Japan. So, as someone with an interest in visual culture, what can you tell me about how queer or LGBT plus culture is being represented and explored in contemporary Japanese cinema? And furthermore, is the term queer appropriate to use in this cultural context? Okay, so to talk about you know whether the term queer is appropriate or correct, you know, in Japanese culture, you know, in in Japanese context, I think we sort of need to go back to how we started using queer when. So as queer, we also say queer in Japanese. So queer came to Japan in the 1990s, I would say, and in the emergence of queer studies in the mid 1990s. And what's interesting about uh, Japanese adaptation of queer is that we didn't really, uh, in my opinion, we didn't really differentiate queer from lesbian gay studies. It pretty much all came almost together. So there was just journal, you know, came, came out in 1994, 1995, queer studies and LGBT, you know, studies at the same time almost. So, um, like in in the US, for instance, queer studies didn't emerge as a kind of response, as a critical response to gay and lesbian studies. And that is part of the kind of really interesting story of queer studies in Japan. But I have to say that queer, interestingly, came to Japan even earlier than academic field through film culture. So I uh, did a little bit archival research and I found out that in 1993 there was already a kind of culture magazine which sort of you know had issue on queer cinema in Japan so I really would like to say that queer came to Japan almost through culture film culture even earlier than academic field or even activism so that's kind of really interesting sort of uh, history of queer in Japan and again, I think it's always difficult, you know, what we mean by queer, right? And uh, I, my um, stance is always, you know, it's, it's, I can't really generally say this is queer in Japanese context. It's impossible to summarize, you know, what queer means in Japanese context. I always think that you know queer really depends on the context right rather than in the u.s or in japan so each time we use queer in queer cinema queer director we try to explain describe what we mean by queer women director queer you know male director so i think it's really hard for me to say generally you know what queer means or represent in japan and fantastic. So there is very much a kind of, um, there is uh, queer elements in Japanese cinema, but then there's also the influence of queer creators and queer producers and directors mm-hmm. as well. Yeah, fantastic. right. So again, I think, so I was thinking your question about, you know, what queer or LGBTQ uh, is being represented in contemporary Japanese cinema. So it's not just representation per se, right, but more like a wider film culture, right? So kind of publication and journal and spectatorship. So representation, it's been always there, right? Queer like, lesbian like characters, narratives and thematic concerns are always there. But you know, what makes something queer is it really depends on the context and and if you know, in terms of representation, right, we have always had queer representations, you know, gay characters, lesbian narratives, images, yes, but 
um, if we want to talk about sort of uh, queer culture in Japan, I think we have to think a little bit, go beyond each tax, individual tax, but who and you know for what, for which community. So I think you know it really depends on the context. And sure, queer is you know long word from English, and and we all know. But you know, but gay and lesbian are also. Long word from English, and if we say, "Well, that's not really Japanese," or you know, those concepts are falling to Japanese culture, then you know, we really cannot talk about、um, identity、um, and community, which has become Japanese pretty much now. So I think, yes, of course, it's it, identity, gay, lesbian, queer. Each word has. More kind of specific meaning, and you know, it's not the same as queer, gay, lesbian, maybe in the United States, for instance. But yes, I mean, culture is always heterogeneous and and hybrid. So I really don't think Japanese culture is you know purely singular and unique. That doesn't exist. So it's always you know we borrow from China and Korea and and United States. So I think if It's just you know if you want to queer in a specific context, we just kind of want to be careful about how contextualize this this concept. So just as a side question relating to that,、um, so the actual word queer is it is has it been directly supplanted from English language into Japanese? Is it is it spelled differently? Has it been adapted or? Yeah, it, it, it's written in katakana, and we pronounce as queer to, I guess, English language. But yeah, and lesbian and and gay, we also use those words、um, like English, you know. So I I think you know queer is not just you know sometimes queer studies or queer theory.、Uh, People criticize like that's a very、uh, Western or even American、uh, concept and 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 very elitist in a sense. But at the same time, I I, I think yes, it can be. But gay and lesbians are not not really better than <laughs> queer. So okay, thank you. How do elements of queer culture representation and exploration in Japanese cinema? Differ from those found in more Western cinema. Again, it's uh, really uh, hard to say. But just for instance, if we think about the beginning, the very beginning of Japanese cinema, right, and all the female parts were performed by male actors because the cinema was sort of you know、uh, cinema developed. On the basis of theatrical tradition, including kabuki, so all the performers, all the actors were men. Right. So from the beginning, in a way, Japanese cinema was queer. All you know, they all sort of you know only men performed female characters, and then in the twenties, more kind of biological female bodies started playing women. Part women characters, so、um, I think just from the beginning, yeah. If you want to talk about you know how queer Japanese cinema can be, it's been always queer in a way. That's amazing. I didn't know that at all. That's、yeah. fascinating. <laughs>、um, so my next question is: What impact is queer film having in Japanese culture at this time? Over what time frame has there been a notable emergence of this type of media, and do you feel that it's helping to enact social change or encourage conversations surrounding LGBTQ plus issues? Okay, so I really、uh, think, and I hope that we get to learn complexity, and ambiguity, and even contradictions of gender and sexuality through queer cinema, queer films.、Um, I think you know what. If there's something、uh, queer cinema can do, is like really we get to learn not just positive, negative images and stereotypes of you know LGBTQ people, but I think you know queer cinema
can really um, show really complex issues. So that's that's what I like about the idea of queer. It really allows flexible, you know, kind of flexible, complex, not always uh, wonderful, correct representations, but it really sh it can show contradictions and difficulties and already the full spectrum. Um, because, yeah, <laughs> when, uh, of representations and narrative. And that's what I really like to call queer cinema, what it can do. Yeah. I was going to say, do you find that it's being engaged with by a mainstream audience? It's really difficult. I mean, for instance, in contemporary Japanese cinema, right, we have really interesting uh, queer directors, male and female and, and transgender uh, filmmakers, but not so many in mainstream film. And there are a lot of great independent filmmakers, um, but in mainstream, it's really hard to see a representation of LGBTQ people beyond really stereotypes. Yeah. You know? And especially if we include uh, TV and, you know, if we go beyond just cinema, a wider uh, media landscape, I think in a lot of um, cross-dressing um, male showbiz people are more visible and, and gay men to a certain extent, but it's really rare to see a lesbian why do you and think that is? I think definitely there's this gender, you know, issue, you know. Um, there's also tradition of sort of cross-dressing kind of gay, um, uh, you know, personalities on TV and there's strong tradition in Japan for mm -hmm. that. But um, I think, you know, lesbian and bisexual and transgender, especially trans uh, men, are really not visible in media and and there's something i mean it's certainly we're getting more and you know a lot of people start obviously coming out but um it's still it's still rare to see women and and trans men um I, yeah Okay. I mean, I, it, there, you know, there might be a lot of reason, and you know, lesbian has been always uh, invisible, like anywhere else <laughs> in Japan too, yeah. and and also there's the stereotype of gay men who uh, speak in a certain way we call it one characters, and so those are always popular, and people seem to really like when they scold you on TV and they really want to be scolded by these cross-dressing <laughs> men. But, so it, it, it's really interesting, this, this um, dynamics, who, who gets represented and who doesn't. And there's certainly gender issues, not, not just sexuality. Yeah. Of course. So just to go on to a question that was put forward by one, one of the listeners, so they were saying that there is a huge following for boys' love, mm -hmm. so yaoi and yuri media mm -hmm. in Japan. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to ask, is this something that is viewed as only acceptable in media, or is it more mainstream in wider society? Here? I, I think now it's getting more and more uh, mainstreaming and uh, accepted as a very uh, powerful kind of cultural text and representation and I think it's it certainly boys love uh, is really part of contemporary queer culture in Japan. Uh, for those who are not acquainted with this subject, yaoi is a term for boys love and yuri is a term for girls love, genres of fictional media found in light novels, manga, anime, video games and other forms of Japanese media that explore same gender attraction. These genres have a notable following in the UK and US, but I myself was unsure as to what extent individuals within Japan engaged with these genres and topics. When queer culture in Japan, um, 
I don't know <laughs> much about Yaoi and Oz love. And certainly in early days, there uh, were a lot of discussions, you know, whether it is appropriation of gay people, right? Because certainly a lot of consumers and readership was supposedly uh, made of a straight woman, young woman. And I think now it's changing. I know that a lot of gay men themselves enjoy uh, BL. And, and again, I think there's something uh, gender-related issues in terms of readership and spectatorship. Why so many women are attracted to this male-male? Uh, romance and, and erotics and certainly there's you know kind of fantasy element and 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 I think interestingly there so why male male desire is so interesting so attractive to a lot of women straight or non-straight you know uh, I sense that there is also very strongly gender related you know uh, issues of course so one final question just out of curiosity if somebody was interested in engaging in contemporary queer japanese cinema mm. what would you recommend that they start with in terms of what should they watch what should they check out i would say even in the late 60s there are a lot of interesting uh, queer um cinema in Japan. For instance, um, Funeral Parade of Roses by Matsumoto Toshio. There's a sort of gay culture in Shinjuku in the late 60s, very politicized Japan and gay uh, transgender character and it's male uh, director, but uh, you know, it certainly uh, it's really interesting uh, queer character. And I would say contemporary um, girls cinema and friendship cinema is very queer in Japan. I think there's a, again really interesting cultural cultural genealogy of, of female friendship in literature and in cinema. So often uh, in Japanese cultural text, uh, sexuality and erotics are not explicitly uh, expressed. So often friendship becomes very, you know, the very site of this erotic expressions and sexual possibilities. So queer cinema in the context of Japanese, you know, contemporary cinema, I would say that, you know, even though it's, it doesn't look like explicitly sexual, erotic, queer, you know, a lot of uh, girls' friendship films are really interestingly queer. That's amazing. Uh Thank you so very much. I had not anticipated the matter of the male-female gender divide to be so central to the subject of queer representation in Japanese media. Although I wasn't greatly surprised as, even in Western media, gay men have always benefited from greater representation than other members of the LGBTQ community. I did not anticipate the lesbian communities of Japan to have been so profoundly overlooked. Furthermore, I was disappointed to hear of how trans women appear to have significantly greater media representation than trans men. However, given this binaristic gender division that is apparently so integral to Japanese society, one could speculate that many individuals continue to assume what many Western societies have incorrectly assumed too, that gay men and trans women are one and the same, since they are both assumed to be, and thus assigned, male at birth. When trans women are portrayed in Western media, it can often be for comedic purposes, because it is seen as debasing and humiliating for an individual who was assigned male at birth to be presenting themselves in a feminine manner, given that the feminine presenting individuals are often second-class citizens within a patriarchal power dynamic. Although at this time I am unaware as to whether or not this is a practice which exists in Japanese entertainment, it could explain the cultural parallels. <laughs> 
As Professor Kano and I discussed the contrasting natures of Western and Eastern queer cultures, one thing became evident. Japanese queer culture focused more on sexuality and less on gender presentation. Between us, we theorized as to whether or not this was tied into the collectivist and individualist values of Western and Eastern communities. In psychology, early cultural research reduced the complexities of Western and Eastern social norms down to the binary of individualism versus collectivism. To summarize, it has been suggested that where Western, predominantly US and UK cultures, encourage individuals to focus on their personal needs, wants and aspirations, Eastern cultures often encourage individuals to consider their identities as inherently entwined with those of their families, friends, and wider society. This collectivism encourages a conscientiousness regarding how one's personal choices influence and impact their broader social circles. It was on this basis that Professor Kano and I pondered if, perhaps, external expression of queerness in a community where gender roles are still rigid and undeniably presented within a binary, is an excursion or deviation from this social rule, which would not be considered simply a personal rebellion, but an act of rupture intended to negatively affect the lives of others. Perhaps being queer was considered a deeply personal matter because anxieties persisted regarding how making that queerness visible could impact one's ability to effectively perform their social roles within their own community. Of course, there are many mediums in which queerness is being addressed and discussed in contemporary Japan. On top of the exploration of queerness in Japanese cinema, contemporary artists of Japanese origin have been using their mediums to explore matters of queer sexuality since the late 20th century. Masami Taraoka is a Hiroshima-born artist whose work incorporates traditional Japanese visual art styles, in particular, the use of ukiyo-e style woodblock printing. Although Teraoka's work does not overtly portray explicitly queer individuals, his style and subject matter undeniably calls upon matters of the queer experience. In a print from his AIDS series, titled Geisha in Bath, a feminine presenting individual is seen waist-deep in bathwater, tearing open a packet of condoms with her teeth. In her hair, she wears kanzashi, which are a form of accessory worn in the hair. In this case, these are long, wooden sticks. Across the wood, dark patches are visible, which are recognisable to many as Carposi sarcoma. For those of you who listened to my previous interviews with Sister Roma of the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, you may remember her mentioning Carposis as a form of cancer most prevalent amongst individuals living with AIDS. There is a sense of androgyny to the geisha's body. Although her broad shoulders and small breasts are not inherently masculine, she is not portrayed as stereotypically feminine either. This presentation of androgyny is also noticeable in another piece called Mates, part of Teraoka's Tale of a Thousand Condoms collection, in which an androgynous couple embraces in the back of a taxi. There is an evident power dynamic, as the individual with earrings and red nails is the larger of the two cradling their partner who is lying somewhat submissively in their arms. Feminine aesthetics become juxtaposed with the scale of the body in comparison with their more masculine-coded partner and the dynamic at play between the two. As Professor Kano shared with me, the binaristic division of maleness and femaleness is still integral to one's identity in Japan, even as a queer individual, and so to see art from a Japanese artist which plays with gender presentation in this way is exciting and insightful. Within queer representation lies power, and that power is drawn from how an image can spark a conversation concerning subjects previously unspoken within a community or a society. During my time in Tokyo, I have also been fortunate enough to be introduced to the works of Eikimori, a Japanese photographer and performance artist whose work has often focused on male sexuality. In a video I was shown of a collection of his public performances titled A Poet, We See a Rainbow, Mori is seen dressed in a heavy, hooded white gown made of embroidered material, holding aloft a white, tulle fabric umbrella, as he reads his poetry in a public hall, a local plaza, or outside of a public building. 
His visual appearance is notably feminine, and the act of reading his work aloud makes his performance socially disruptive in a way which is powerful and deeply vulnerable. This is not covert queerness, and it is not a queerness which is indicative of any desire to assimilate. It is bold and challenging, and in witnessing this I am aware of how, in my own desire to understand queer Japanese culture, I may have been quick to overlook the heterogeneity, the great variance of the queer Japanese lived experience. It would be reductive to assume that there is one singular, homogenous way in which queerness is being represented in contemporary Japanese media. And through the insight Professor Kano provided regarding queer Japanese cinema and the works of Masami Taraoka and Eikimori, it has become evident to me that what is being shared in Japanese visual arts is a number of vast and incommensurable presentations of queerness that cannot and should not be reduced down to a singular concept. I invite you to take a look at the aforementioned artworks of Teraoka and Mori, which I have made available on the Slash Queer Gallery page for this episode. You will not be disappointed by their work. My time in this country has just begun, and as an outsider, it is already becoming increasingly evident that the Japan I had heard about whilst living in the UK is not the Japan I am learning about whilst here. If my time with Professor Kano taught me anything, it is that not only did the term queer arrive here before academia ever exported it to Japan, but that queerness is not the great taboo we are often led to believe it is through our own Western media. There are brands of queer activism and feminism which often fall short of implementing a truly reflexive, intersectional lens. Because they place themselves upon a pedestal as examples of social progressiveness. For example, Many Western communities may deem a woman's employment to be indicative of her freedom and emancipation from patriarchal power structures. In conjunction, we may assume that a woman from a non-Western culture who achieves the opportunity to stay at home and raise her children, instead of being forced into low-wage labour in order to survive, is in fact being oppressed by those same patriarchal power structures. Our idea of what it means to be free, autonomous, represented and emancipated is not a global one. The focuses of activism, particularly queer activism, often need to be subjective to the cultural context, and I see queer visibility in Japanese media as being no different. We presume that our queerness must be universal, that all communities must want to present this concept within the same parameters, the same regulations, but that is not the case. Just as Professor Kano explained to me how Japanese culture has internalized and absorbed concepts and traditions from non-Japanese communities, it is also evident that those concepts and traditions evolve with time. Eastern queerness does not have to mirror Western queerness. Gender ambiguity does not have to be used to non-verbally communicate our position as a sexually variant individual. Nonetheless, one can hope that Japanese culture is also evolving to make space for those who do wish to demonstrate their queerness visibly, outside of the defined gendered presentations that are so pervasive throughout the country. The work of Masami Teraoka and Eiki Mori makes us wonder what space is available for those who cannot and do not wish to conform to the gendered expectations of aesthetic presentation, and how that space can be created and mediated for Japanese queer communities, if it is so desired. But these are questions for another time, and another episode, when I will be interviewing a collective of inspiring young activists in Tokyo, who can tell me what's on the agenda for a queer Japanese revolution. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. We have just begun to scratch the surface of queer Japan. This episode of the Slash Queer Podcast was edited by Charles Mackamson and scripted and produced by me, Georgie Williams. A very special thanks to Professor Yuka Kano of Stanford University and Toshisha University for her insight. Many thanks also to fellow researcher Marta Fanaska, Sho Akita, and Ken Nakahashi, as well as a quick shout out to Saskia Williams for providing technical support. Just a heads up as well for those who were not previously aware. Transcripts are available for every episode of this podcast on the homepage of Slash Queer, just below the media player.
I'd also like to take a moment to thank my Patreon subscribers for supporting me getting to Japan in the first place to produce this episode. Every leg of this tour prior to this episode has been personally funded, so thank you for your generous contributions. It really means the world to me. If you do enjoy this podcast and wish to contribute in any way to supporting this venture, it would be wonderful to have you on board as part of the Slash Queer team. You can find the Slash Queer Patreon at patreon.com forward slash slash queer. That's S-L-A-S-H queer. The link is also available on our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter pages. I am always grateful for anything you are willing to give towards making this podcast happen. If you cannot give anything financially, I am equally grateful for you subscribing to the podcast or sharing these episodes with friends and loved ones. Slash Queer is, now more than ever, a community project, and I appreciate anyone who goes the extra mile to share these stories with the people in their lives. This episode was recorded on location in Kyoto and Tokyo in Japan. Music in this episode was composed by Kevin MacLeod. If you enjoyed this episode or have any feedback, please get in touch on Instagram or Twitter at at slash queer, or email us at slash queer at outlook.com. As is our custom now, until next time, stay kind, stay radical, and stay queer. <laughs>